right, everyone. Welcome back to Financial Clarity for Doctors. I'm Corey Janoff, joined as always by Rochelle Vanderzanden. I'm here too. And today we want to talk about your happiness and satisfaction and how that is largely tied to your expectations. So, you know, we can crunch numbers, use spreadsheets and calculators and financial projections, but really, you know, if you look at you know, the numerous studies out there, you know, really regardless how much you make, how much you have, there, there's people who are miserable because they always want more. So, you know, th I think a, a good theme to being able to achieve your financial goals and be happy and satisfied is just keeping your expectations somewhat realistic and, uh, and, and achievable. You know, for example, kind of a, a cheesy little example, um, not too long ago, I was uh, coming home from work, and I knew we hadn't gone to the grocery store that week. We hardly had anything in the, you know, fridge or pantry that I'd want to eat. I mean, it was just basically snack food, and uh, you know, hungry for dinner. And you know, I knew we'd, when I get home, we'd have to try and get the kids to bed and everything. So I was just gonna, I was, I was not looking forward to that evening and and being hungry and dealing with screaming kids. But I get home, and sitting on the counter is some leftover frozen oven baked Kirkland signature pizza. And uh, I, I was pumped because I expected nothing to be ready for dinner. And my wife had, had taken out a frozen pizza from the oven and made it. And, you know, the Kirkland brand, top notch, everyone's favorite. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I, I had zero expectations. I was expecting nothing. I got something. So I was, I was stoked. Um, you know, it could have gone the opposite way though, if I had come home expecting a steak dinner and wine and quiet, calm children, um, I would have been very disappointed in, in how the evening turned out. So, you know, it goes both ways, you know, you can either exceed your expectations or you can fall short of them. So just framing that, uh, is really powerful in your level of happiness and satisfaction. I think kids are a really good example of that because obviously when you're really, really, really little, you don't know what to expect. You don't have any expectations really. And so littlest, like the littlest kids, the two, three year olds who are just starting to enjoy their birthdays and Christmas and things like that, they often don't have any expectations at all, which means that anything they get, they are pumped about. They are so excited. My daughter was the same way, where it was just, it didn't really matter what it was. I remember one year we bought her $8 worth of clip on earrings for her birthday, and she was pumped. Like, that was the best thing that we could have gotten her, and it literally cost us less than $10. But over time, that has developed. She's now almost six. She's a little bit more savvy. She probably watches more TV and sees advertisements more than she should. And she knew last Christmas that she really wanted a Barbie house and had an entire sketch drawn out and basically drew a design for Santa so that she could get exactly what she wanted, which is really hard because you can't take a small child's design and then go shopping for it at a store and find exactly what it is that they're looking for. But then again, she's still little enough that it didn't matter that it wasn't exactly what was in her imagination. Like what she got was still something that made her very happy. And, you know, you can explain all you want that, that Santa has some specifics that he has to work with it and all of that kind of stuff. My kids are super funny. Then again, I did actually make the mistake of showing her this house that was available in the Portland West Hills. So I don't know if any of you listening are aware of like Portland geography, but Corey and I are both in Portland, Oregon, and up in the hills is where all the fancy houses are. And I came across a news article that had this full-on video tour of a house that was for sale that was about $10 million up in the hill. And it was gorgeous. It had this like a lap pool overlooking the, the city and all of like all of these things. So I showed the video to my daughter to let and she was like, mom, why can't we buy that house? So I think those expectations go both ways with kids where they have no concept of what money really means. But, you know, you can give them something small and they're happy, but they say the big things and they really want the big things, too. So it definitely goes both ways with kids. We talked a lot about how, you know, that was a lot of money. And she offered me all of the quarters and I had to explain to her that that wasn't quite enough to get the $10 million out. But I think that over time, that relationship develops a lot. Like kids are brand new and we can start by building those expectations with them, too, and 
teach them the value of money. But I think as adults, we get really ingrained in what our expectations are, are, and it's kind of hard to dial those back. So it's really important to try to live or like to try to moderate your expectations to the resources that you have very early on and make sure that that, that relationship works together. For sure. Surprised you didn't take it to Pinterest and uh, Instagram and find the do-it-yourself Barbie house to make it according to the exact <laughs> architectural designs of your five-year-old. <laughs> Corey, you don't know me at all. That is so not my style. <laughs> yeah, my wife will like pull up something. Look at what so-and-so did with their you know yard mm -hmm. or their bedroom. I'm like, okay, I don't own an electric saw. I can't do that. <laughs> but yeah. yeah, no, kids are a great one. I love like even the really little kids, you could like just wrap an empty box. They just like tearing the paper off and playing with the cardboard box. And uh, like right mm -hmm. now, our two-year-old, every time we get an Amazon package, which is too frequently to admit, like he just likes ripping the tape and the labels off of the boxes. And like anything that's in a box, he'll find it and, and start peeling stickers and labels off of it. So um, you can get pretty inexpensive gifts for the, the toddlers for sure. Um, mm -hmm. And I mean, you could think of endless examples of where the expectations and the reality, and I mean, the title of this post or this episode, I think is great, you know, t turning this into a math formula, but reality minus expectations equals satisfaction. So if the reality is greater than what you expected, you, you've got a positive satisfaction um, on the satisfaction meter. Uh, if, if reality is worse than you expected, then you're going to be a little disappointed. I mean, look at if you, you see a movie that you're excited for and the movie wasn't as good as you had hoped, you had you know big expectations, you're like, oh, well, that was a waste of time and money. But if you want to do... Yeah, but if you go in thinking it's, you know, oh, this will just be a dumb movie, you know, mindless and, you know, funny, I'll just put it on because I'm bored and don't want to think and just want to stare at a screen for an hour and a half, and it actually turns out to be a decent movie, you're like, oh, wow, that was actually pretty good. I'm glad I watched that. Um, and, and you're pretty excited, even though it may not win an Oscar, but at least, you know, you you, you got your, you felt like your, your time was well spent watching that um, movie. And I mean, it, you know, of another funny example at uh, one of my um, uh, my dad's friends, he, he like he was married for a long time, and asked, you know, how how did uh, you know how do you guys you know make it that long? You know, a long marriage. It's it's. I mean, I guess it's common, but you know, you see a lot of people don't last super long. He's like, oh, every meal is a feast and, and every day is a holiday. It's like, well, if you go into your marriage expecting every meal to be a feast and every day to be a holiday, you're probably in for a rude awakening. You know, no relationship's perfect. You know, you can expect to have some rainy days. You can expect to eat hot dogs and craft mac and cheese. Uh, or top ramen or, or, or frozen Kirkland signature pizza for dinner from time to time. Um, and, and that's okay. You know, it doesn't all have to be, you know, amazing every single day, you know, every life has its ups and downs, but uh, it's, it's expecting it being able to navigate the, the stormy waters and come out on the other end stronger. So I think, like you said, Rochelle, keeping the expectations in check um, and, you know, realistic with what you know, for you is super important in the life satisfaction. I think one of my favorite quotes from writer uh, Morgan Housel, who if you if you aren't familiar with him, definitely encourage you all to read his book, The Psychology of Money. He also writes a blog um, at collaborativefund.com. Um, I think that's the website, but he works for the Collaborative Fund and he writes a blog for them. I think it, it usually comes out weekly, but sometimes it misses a beat, but um, he's he's a great writer, really good with words, and uh, the quote is, a good way to always feel behind is when your expectations grow faster than your income, which I think is huge. You know, everyone throughout their career hopes their income will go up, and especially in the, the medicine world, you know, you start out making nothing, negative income with the student loans you take out. You go into residency where you're making an average income for an American, you know, middle class income, but you don't have a lot of expectations at that stage. You know, you're still eating the top ramen. Um, you know, you, you, you 
you know, go on the, the discount movie night to the movies and, uh, and the expectations are relatively low. But then you get into your attending job and all of a sudden your expectations for most people explode um, and, and balloon and, and get significantly larger. And that's perfectly okay. I mean, you've been grinding away, working your butt off. You know, it's, it's absolutely fine to have some of that delayed gratification and, and desire for a little bit more and, you know, some of the nicer things in life. But we have to be careful and not overdo it. So, you know, if your income goes from, you know, 70000 up to 270000 overnight, sure, we can afford to take on a little lifestyle creep. But if we're not careful, you know, we're going to still feel like we're strapped financially and, and feel stressed because our expectations rose at the same pace or even faster than our income. And, and, and you're not, you're going to end up not being super happy as a result, even though you have a lot more than you did when you were in training. Yeah. I have a lot of people, you know, jump from training into their first attending job and just spend a lot of money because they felt like they had deprived themselves for a really long time, which really, you know, they had been trying to live within their means for a long time. I was actually talking to a client the other day who was just going through that. And he was like, we need help. We're acting like children. <laughs> but he literally said that. He's like, we have all this money and we're acting like children. And we need you to, to like help us make sure that we stop doing that. <laughs> and so, I mean, they, they bought a puppy and they bought a whole bunch of furniture for their new house that they bought and, and all sorts of things and put that money to work pretty quickly. But I think a, a lot of it is just, you know, Tucking some of that money away for other uses early so you don't have all of those resources just at your disposal, at your fingertips all the time. Because the second you get used to spending it, you're going to want to keep spending it. And you're going to want to keep that, that lifestyle going. And your expectations have already crept up. And it's really, really, really hard to dial it back after that. Time. So, yeah, I mean, just be careful. Don't compare yourself to other people. Don't be like this is what it should be like because I make this much money. There is no should be. There is no, like, this is what it has to be. It's all about what your own expectations are for you and your family. For sure. I mean, we've talked about it before with, you know, I think in our budgeting episode and our one about savings and probably some other times, but if you can make sure that you, you prioritize your financial goals first and you're setting enough aside to achieve those goals, then with whatever's left, go nuts. If you can afford the million dollar house and afford the nice car and you know the, the nice vacations and to send your kids to private school and you're still on track for achieving your goals, more power to you. That's fantastic. That's awesome. Um, but not everyone you know, is in that boat. And, and within the doctor space, there's a wide range of incomes. You know, you're On the lower end of the spectrum, we have people and attending level jobs earning under 200,000 a year. On the higher end, like I have clients earning upwards of a million dollars per year. So the you know the the person earning a million dollars a year can afford a more extravagant lifestyle than the person earning 150 or 175,000 a year and you know it's just math like you can if you have more coming in you can do more with it. Um, so we got to, you know, try again, like you said, Rochelle, try not to compare yourself to others just because you might have other peers with the MD or the DO, the, the doctor initials, you know, they could be in completely different circumstances as you either better or worse. And, and you don't have to all be on the same playing field when it comes to, you know, what you have and, and, and what you expect. Um, that's where I think the social media, the Instagram, you know, we all are aware of it. We all poke fun at it. it's it's a you know highlight reel of people's lives. It only shows the good and amazing stuff. Yet we still all get sucked into it and it's like, oh look at what so and so is doing. Oh look where they went to vacation. Oh look how well behaved their kids are. And you know, it's like we know it's like a filtered version of our lives, but we still it, it affects our minds. Um, so we really gotta be careful and and really try and just worry about ourselves and, and not what others are doing um the keeping up with the joneses you know just trying as hard as it is to do just, just don't 
do it. <laughs> Easier said than done, <laughs> of course. <laughs> Unless yeah. you can afford to, and as far it's as, still achievable. Yeah. Goals. yeah, and as far as like, you know, one person making $150,000 versus another person making a million dollars, there's a lot of studies out there that show that more money beyond like a, a baseline amount does not necessarily make you happy. And I feel like it really relates to this expectation thing. So, you know, if you have enough to meet your basic needs, probably have a little bit of extra so that you have some flexibility within your life to be able to have fun and spend time with your family and do the things that you want to do. Like anything beyond that is extra. And maybe you could get more things, but it's not necessarily going to make you happier, especially if you have these expectations that you just get more and more and more at that point. Um, and so I think it, it's really all about the mindset more than anything else. And this does not just relate to spending and things and, and money. It also relates to other parts of your financial plan. Like, what are my investments doing? Like, if you have expectations that you're going to get 15% every year in your portfolio and it's going to grow like that until you retire, you're probably in for a rude awakening. Like, that is very unlikely to happen. You can even look at it and say, okay, so my financial advisor says I'm going to get 7 to 10% on average, which I'm not saying you necessarily will, but just as an example. And then if you use that as your expectation of what happens every year, because that's the average, again, in some years, you're going to be really disappointed because returns in, in the stock market are incredibly variable. So there are lots of years when you can be down significantly. There's lots of years when you can be up significantly. And it really is very helpful to temper your expectations and be prepared for years when you lose money because you will lose money in the stock market at some point. For sure. I think it's really like it's worth highlighting that. Sure, you may, you can Google and find long term average for stock market and you'll find a, a variety of numbers. You know, does it include dividend reinvestments? How far back do they go? Which index are they looking at? Um, but if, if you fixate and anchor on whatever that average is, odds are in a given year, you're going to either be wildly excited or wildly disappointed. It's very rare that the market, whatever market you're looking at, actually returns anywhere near the average in a given year. You know, the average is just the sum of all the parts divided by the number of parts. So, you know, if you're looking at the last 50 years, what's the what's the number, you know, add up all the returns each year, divide by 50, and that's what your average is. Um, but it's 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 rarely going to ever fall near the average. You know, one year you're up 20%. Next year you're up, you know, 18%. Next year you're down 15%. Next year you're up 15%. Next year you're up 12%. Sure, maybe the average is somewhere in that 7 to 10 range, Rochelle, but there was not a single year where you were anywhere close to 7 or 10 or anything like that. So, um, I, I would prefer, let's look at what's the range of possibilities. And if you're investing in stocks, it's like positive 60% to negative 60%. Like somewhere in that range is most likely where you're going <laughs> to fall in any given single year. If you're outside of that range, um, either something kind of crazy is happening for good or for bad. You know, usually it'll be something for bad and then a, a massive rebound the next year or a couple of years later where you get the positive 60 plus. But, uh, you know, it's it's throughout history. That's that's very rare. Um, but it's a roller coaster ride. It's, it's such a roller coaster ride. So really avoid fixating on what's the average and, and making that the expectation. Um because it's just not right. Plus, if you're in a well-diversified portfolio, if you have U.S. stocks, international stocks, large companies, small companies, growth, value, bonds, corporate bonds, you know, government bonds, junk bonds, emerging market debt, you know, currencies, real estate. Like if you have a diversified portfolio, commodities, a bunch of different asset classes in it like, that are hopefully not all perfectly correlated. That's the whole point of being diversified as things move differently from each other like th there's zero point in even looking at an average for any investment and trying to fixate on that because if you look for example oh what's the average of the u.s stock market and then take your diversified globally portfolio and and pin it to that it's like you're 
you're going to be all over the map and it's not going to be anywhere close to the average. Some years it'll do better. Some years it'll do worse, but you're going to like, it's just going to be a, a whipsaw for you. So uh, I would try and throw all expectations for returns out the window when you're looking at your investments and instead just look at what are my goals? Am I on track to reach my goals? And if so, great. You know, who cares what the specific return is from one year to the next? You know, we're on track. That's all that matters at the end of the day. If we're not on track, what can we do to try and course correct, you know, that's in our control? Because, like, you can't control the returns. You know, there's only so many things that you can control. So, you know, really, let's just focus on the aspects that we can control and, and and try not to stress too much about the stuff that's out of our control. Yeah, and I think one important thing to note with the stock market is that it can be a lot of up and down. It can also be a few years of relatively mediocre performance. Like you can see that like one year it's 3%, the next year it's negative 2%, the next year it's 6%. And like it just doesn't make you feel all warm and fuzzy, but that happens in the stock market too. And I think those kind of longer term trends can be a little bit more uncomfortable because you're like, oh no, is this what it's gonna be like moving forward? But we're not looking at a five year time horizon for most people. We're looking at, you know, 25, 30 years. Even if you're nearing retirement, you probably still need some of that money to last you another 30 years. So some of it is still long term money. So try not to fixate too much on what's happening in the short term, even if the short term is a trend that's going for like, you know, two, three, four years, that's still basically short term within the stock market. Oh yeah. We've I think mentioned before, if you need the money in less than five years, you have no business being anywhere near the stock market, like stock markets for long-term money. So stop worrying about the year to year or quarter to quarter or week to week numbers. You just drive yourself Absolutely. nuts. Yeah. We mentioned Morgan Housel earlier um, with the book Psychology of Money, which I think they're also making a movie of, right, Corey? I have no idea, but that'd be cool if they are. I thought that that was a thing. Yeah, I think Maybe. we'll have to Google it. <laughs> um, another one of our, our favorite authors and kind of contributors in this space is Carl Richards, who does some very, very, very cool like sketches that are very simple to understand and very clearly articulate some, some pretty deep concepts, honestly. But he has one that Corey and I both love, and it's a Venn diagram with two circles. And basically, Corey pulled it up on the screen if you are watching the YouTube video at all. But it basically, it shows things that matter in one circle and things you can control in the other circle. And where there's overlap, where it's something you can control and it matters, that's what you should spend your time and energy on. So again, like if, if you have high expectations of what you can control, that can be a little bit disorienting like we want to make sure that we actually do have control over things before we spend a lot of time focusing time and energy on it so what are the things that matter i mean it's going to be things like your family your friends your health your work like does it have an impact is it something you enjoy doing job security like is it are you concerned about not having a job? Are you concerned about not getting enough hours? Like those things can matter a lot because they, they affect us and our, our emotional well-being and our family's well-being too. Um, other things are like hobbies, um, basic necessities, food, water, shelter, all of that stuff really, really matters. And then other than that, you know, maybe value just kind of depends on, on who you are as a person, but that can be really, really important to some folks. And then if we think about the things that we can control, some of it's going to be money. Some of it we can't control when it comes to money. So maybe focus on the things that you can. Like, do I have control over how much I work, how much time I spend with my family? If I give up a little bit of my income, am I able to spend more time with them? And is that something that I want to do? Is that something I can handle in my financial picture? Um, with your health, you can control that to a certain degree. Like some things obviously are beyond our control, but you know, maybe we can take care of our bodies a little bit better. That we can control for sure. Um, yeah, I think how much you save and invest, if your spending is well controlled, how much you're putting away for your, your long-term well-being is within what you're controlled to. And how much you spend. I think there are some basic necessities we need, but beyond that, a lot of it is voluntary spending. And it may not feel like it, but it really is. 
Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, everyone's different too. This is all subjective on what matters to you might be different than what matters to Rochelle and I and what matters to your friends or colleagues. So it's really individual. Um, you know, I think you hit it on the head though. Family, friends, health, like we can't totally control our health, but you can do some like exercise, eat vegetables and uh, get mm -hmm. sleep, drink water, things like that. Um, the, uh, you know, the, the items that you can control, we talked about, oh, you could potentially work less and spend more time with family or friends. But, you know, if, if you have some ambitious financial goals, you potentially could work more to earn more income and tackle the student loans faster or, you know, stuff away more for retirement or the kid's college. You know, it goes both ways. We got to find that balance, though. You don't just want to work, work, work and avoid your family and friends and, and you know, be miserable. But, you know, there, there could be some opportunities to make headway on the financial front if you have that choice for sure. So um, we have a lot of younger clients that also focus on that a lot before they have a family. Now, if you're in a situation where you want to have a family long term, but you don't right now and you find yourself with a lot of free time, it can absolutely make sense to work as much as you can and get a head start on things like retirement savings or you know, putting aside money for your future, for a home down payment, for a wedding, if that's what you want to do at some point in time. Um, and when you're doing that without a whole lot of family obligation, that means that when you do have a family, maybe you can take it a little bit easier. Like you can put in some time now to just give yourself a, a really good head start on those things. Yeah, maybe, you know, first couple of years in practice, hammer away the student loans, and then you, you know, there's a several thousand or more per month payment that's out of your life, and that could give you more options on the work side. Maybe you could, like you said, Rochelle, work less to spend more time with the family because that line item is no longer in the expense column. Um, you know, if you knock out the mortgage faster, now we don't have to worry about that. There, there, there's a lot of opportunities if you can. You know, eliminate some of those those costs from your life. Um, you know, pay off the car and then just keep driving the car for another decade. <laughs> Have no car payment. That's helpful. But uh, but yeah, a lot of ways to approach it. Um, and it, it really is individualized. But uh, I think to sum it all up, you know, the expectations keep them in check. Let's try and avoid. You know, you can have lifestyle creep. Absolutely. You deserve it. If your income goes up, you can afford to spend more. But we got to make sure, like Morgan Housel says, we don't let our expectations rise faster than our income. And sure, if we can drive our income higher, then we potentially can allow those expectations to grow. But but focus on those things that matter, things that you can control and uh, and try not to look at Instagram too much. <laughs> oh, Instagram. Anything else you can think well, of? Well, thank show? you for. No, thanks for listening, everyone. Have a good one. See you next time. We would love to hear your feedback and suggestions for future topics you'd like us to cover. You can get in touch with the show by emailing podcast at thefinitygroup.com or by following Finity Group on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube at Finity Group LLC. You can follow me on Twitter at Corey Janoff CFP. Instagram at Corey Janoff or on LinkedIn under my name, Corey Janoff. You can follow me on Twitter at Rochelle Finance or on Instagram, Vanderzanen Rochelle or on LinkedIn under my name, Rochelle Vanderzanen. Check out all of the podcast episodes on the affinitygroup.com slash podcast on our Finity Group YouTube channel or your favorite podcast app. And don't forget to check out our Financial Clarity blog at affinitygroup.com slash blog. Thanks for listening to this episode of Financial Clarity for Doctors by Affinity Group, LLC.